with just a few days left before voters head to the polls in England, Scotland and Wales, the Labour leader has issued an open letter to the country. In what is widely being seen as a test of his leadership, Sir Keir Starmer makes the case that a vote for Labour will lead to more jobs, more police on the streets and will protect the NHS. He joins us now live from Salford. Very good morning to you, Sir Keir Starmer. Morning. Um, it's good to see you this morning back on uh, Good Morning Britain. Y you also have, on Thursday, a very significant by-election. Yeah. Which is taking place in Hartlepool. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news for you at the beginning of the interview, but Good Morning Britain has an exclusive poll done by the survey organisation Servation. It doesn't make for good reading for you. You are on 33%, while the Conservative Party is on 50%. This is a seat which has been held by Labour since 1974. Why are things going so wrong for you? Well, I've been to Hartlepool now three times in this um, by-election, and I know uh, that we have to earn every single vote in Hartlepool. And I know that the priorities of the people in Hartlepool are very much jobs, jobs, jobs. I've been to the nuclear power plant there, uh, which is coming to the end of its natural life. It's been 40 years, and in a few years it starts to be decommissioned. Everybody wants to know what's the next generation of jobs. There are 750 Hartlepool jobs tied up in that power um, plant. I was at Liberty Steel on Saturday morning with the workers there, the steel workers, um, who are facing a very uncertain future, about 250, again, jobs in Hartlepool. So in Hartlepool, what I think is more important than everything, anything is a powerful voice um, focused on what really matters okay. in Hartlepool. Well, and I've got to earn those so votes. You've, you've mentioned significant jobs. Um, with Boris Johnson uh, making Teesside, uh, which will for all intents and purposes, include Hartlepool, a free port, uh, an estimated 18,000 jobs are going to be created. And that is a direct result of Brexit. And Hartlepool voted leave by 69.5%. The fact remains, you were on the wrong side of that argument, weren't you? And that is why the Red Wall collapsed in December 2019, and that is why you were on course to lose Hartlepool, potentially. Well, the first thing, first thing I'd say about um, that is, obviously, uh, we've left the EU, and therefore the debate about leave remain is completely over, um, and we have to make a success um, of leaving the EU. And actually, we've been a bit more focused on how that looks than the government has. The second I'm thing I'd sure say... i the issue well, is just... completely over for that red wall, though, because you need to reconnect, don't you, with those Labour voters yeah. who wanted Brexit and yeah. voted Brexit in those seats. I, and I how are you that. going just, to reconnect with those voters? Just hear me out, because, um, as I say, I can assure you, in the time I've spent in Hartlepool, a lot of time in the last few weeks, the, the main debate is about the jobs of the future. Um, and, you know, it's all very well the government saying, well, you know, we're going to create however many jobs. The government hasn't got a plan for the nuclear plant in Hartlepool. I met an apprentice on the front line in Hartlepool who fully qualifies in 2023, uh, 2022, only for the plant to be beginning to close in 2023. And the, 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 the workforce there say, where's the plan for the future? There isn't one. Um, and uh, look at Liberty Steel. Those workers on the front line I spoke to on Saturday morning are desperate for the government to help them with their jobs. So what we're seeing in Hartlepool is a lot of words from the government about jobs, but when it comes to the actual jobs on the ground, nothing is okay. happening. And, and that's so, why Hartlepool okay. needs a powerful voice okay. for the future. Um, so, Sir Keir Starmer, if I was a, a, a voter who had previously voted Labour and then uh, was very disappointed that you uh, were on the wrong side over Brexit and uh, I voted for Brexit, can you just explain to me why you were in the wallpaper department of John Lewis uh, in the last week? How does that help the voters of Hartlepool? Well, I'll tell you what that was all about. It was about whether the Prime Minister is being straight. And um, I've asked people in Hartlepool this, so I'm very happy to share it with you. When I asked people in Hartlepool whether they would know 
who had paid for the refurbishment of their own flat or house, they all answered yes and laughed at the idea that the Prime Minister says he doesn't know. The Prime Minister is not being straight. I think being Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is the biggest honour and privilege and duty that could possibly um, be held by anybody. And the idea that somehow, into the conversation in the last week, we've, we've said, well, it's priced in that our current Prime Minister isn't going to be straight about simple things. He knows he paid for that Mr. refurbishment Mr. Stoll, of his I, I flat think, and he's I, not being straight about it. I, I think the point Suzanne is making, I mean, you know, was it your idea to go and have that photo opportunity in John Lewis? We, we, you can discuss the issues and quite rightly speak to your constituents. But it, it was a little bit bizarre and strange that it, in such so much to do that you and your team found the time to find the nearest John Lewis store and go and have a photo with some wallpaper. Well, well, whose, me, idea, me, whose, take, whose idea was that? Let me take that head on. That day, I'd been in Manchester, I'd been in Lancashire, I was in Salford. I then went across that very day to Hull, and then the next day I went from Durham up to Hartlepool. Those um, aren't the pictures that people are looking at, though. They're looking at you doing a stunt about wallpaper. And when you say that you talked to voters and they laughed, I wonder whether actually... People just look at that and laugh at it rather than take it seriously and see it as an, uh, you making a very important political point about the integrity and trustworthiness of the Prime Minister. I think you're missing a very, very important point here, and that is that there's a growing feeling that at the top of government there's a sense, a general sense, that the rules don't really apply to them. And whether that's contracts for mates, whether it's sleaze, whether it's WhatsApping the Prime Minister and other senior ministers, there's this, this sense that there's one rule uh, for them and another rule for everybody else. And that goes very strongly against the British yeah, instinct. Yeah, and people don't like it. And understand it. If, if people have gone through the pandemic and their business or they're self-employed, they're on the edge, the idea that others can directly access the Prime Minister or directly access senior ministers uh, when they're struggling on the front line, there's something deeply wrong about that. And this idea that it doesn't really matter, it's priced in that that sort look, of behaviour the, the, is acceptable. I, I find that completely wrong. Yeah, but the point is, Akir Starmer, is that when Labour were in government, you were accused of the same thing. There were sleaze allegations then. We all remember the Bernie Eccleston affair with Tony Blair, uh, cash for honours. There have been various points, and people will know that. They will say, well, you say this now, but once you're in power, you're all the same. So well, let me take that straight on. Since you're putting that to me, I was the Director of Public Prosecutions that prosecuted MPs uh, for breach of the expenses rule. So I know how to take tough decisions. And if I get into power, I want to clean this up. I don't think it's acceptable to simply say, well, it goes on, it's priced in, it's all right. It isn't all right. It needs to be cleaned up because millions of people out there do not want one rule um, for those in government and a one and another rule for everybody else. That is not acceptable. Okay. And I would but, make it yeah, clear okay, that so if I were Prime Minister, I'd clean that up. OK. It, uh, as Adil says, Labour Party doesn't have, or the Labour government, doesn't have a great reputation on this either. Um, and if we're talking about standing holding uh, rolls of wallpaper, the Blairs spent more than £100,000 on refurbishments of the Downing Street flat as well. I mean, don't voters just expect that Prime Ministers come in and spend money on the flat? Is it really that big an issue that you need to make a photo opportunity out well, this, of it? This, this, this is the government that um, stood clapping the NHS front line and then rewarded them with a real-term pay cut because they said they couldn't afford it. How and much I've been would you, into lots and lots of... How much would the Labour government give lots nurses and lots of, as a pay rise? Well, well, just, just hear me out. I've been into lots and lots of hospitals. My wife works in the NHS. And I know that even over that Christmas period, December to January, when those terrible number of deaths, number of uh, people in hospitals, almost every member of staff was being texted every day, on their day off, to say, can you come in yes. to work in any ward to help us out? And at the end of that, the government says, there's not enough money yeah. to reward you, but so there is enough money you... so, okay, uh, to, okay. to spend so on other things raised, that the government thinks is a priority. You've raised that point. Um, uh, the Royal College of Nursing is call, calling for yeah. a 12.5% pay rise. That is the organisation that represents exactly those people you are talking about who have sacrificed so much to keep us going, who have battled on the front line, who have given up their time, who have to spend time away from their families. 
Would Labour back a 12.5% pay rise for nurses? What, would you put your money where your mouth is? What we've said is we would negotiate um, a fair deal that would start, the starting point would be the 2.5% that was promised and actually legislated for, and we would negotiate up from there. It'd have to be uh, a negotiation, of course it would, but we'd be clear about where we'd start and we want a fair outcome. But you what the government sorry, so has, just to establish, the, 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 the organisation representing nurses says that the fair deal would be 12.5%. Would you back what, that, yes or no? Well, what I've said is we would start at the 2.5% that was guaranteed, legislated for, and we'd negotiate up from there. It would have to be a negotiation. But believe well, a you me, I've spent... between 25 well, I, and 12.5%. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I, have, I happen to have spent a lot of time in hospitals, spent a lot of time with NHS staff, as it happens, um, and what they want is a pay rise, a fair pay rise. They do not want a pay cut. That is the stark difference between the Labour Party and the government on this issue. And meanwhile, what they see is, you know, £30 million, I think, to somebody who was in the health sector's WhatsApp um, connections, going to somebody who'd never provided certain types of equipment before. Okay. People know that that's wrong. And the pretense in the last few weeks that this is all... Uh, priced in, I think it's just completely wrong. All right. uh, ju just finally, Sir Keir Starmer, very important week, the local elections coming up, we've talked about Hartlepool, there'll be lots of elections up and down the country. Uh, given that you've talked about already in this interview how you've tried to connect with the, with the constituents, you've been up to Hartlepool three times, you're going to be responsible and honourable throughout your, your, your tenure as leader, and given that there are criticisms from uh, members of the Labour Party about your leadership, if things do not go your way this Thursday, in the interest of the party, will you stand down and give somebody else a chance to lead the Labour Party? We are fighting for every vote into this election. We're trying to earn every vote into this election. I have a burning desire for a better future for our country, and I want this Thursday to be the first step towards that future. I want to demonstrate that the Labour Party is under new leadership and that the priorities of the Labour Party I lead are the priorities of the British public. We're taking that argument uh, into Thursday. Is it a challenge? Of course it is. We lost very badly in December 2019. We always had a mountain to climb. We are climbing so that if, mountain. So if the polls are true and you do lose quite considerably, you still think you're the right person to lead the Labour Party to the general election in years to come? We are fighting for every vote in this election and we're fighting to rebuild the Labour Party, rebuild trust and reconnection. I never thought... And I don't think anybody realistically ever thought that the Labour Party could go from the devastating defeat in 2019, the worst since 1935, and mend all that uh, in about a year or a year and a half. Of course it's going to take longer than that, but we're fighting for, we're more than fighting for, we know we've got to earn every vote into that election this Thursday. All right, Sir Keir Starmer, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. Uh, in Thursday's by-election, this is the full list of candidates running for election in the Hartlepool constituency. And just a reminder, this interview is part of a series of interviews with polit political party leaders ahead of the local and national elections on Thursday.